Welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hallelujah. Here, this time, being Orlando, Florida. Yay. We are in the, our new surroundings here and not quite set up fully. Our new base. Yeah. But uh, so we're, we're giving it our shot right now. So I just want to welcome you in the name of the wonderful name. Yes. The name above all names. Of Amen. Jesus Christ. Thank you. Lord. And I say that on behalf of myself, Alice, and Mark. Yes. And I'm glad that we can be together here for this word. Yes, we are. We're continuing on our study of the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches of Revelation. And our, our last session, we finished up the letter to the church of Thyatira. So today we'll be starting the church at Sardis mm -hmm. in Revelations chapter, Revelation chapter 3. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark of you to just ask God's blessing upon our time in the Word. Oh Lord, we thank you that we can come together and just bless the words that come forth yes. and pour it into people's hearts. Amen. 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 And Lord, may it change our lives. Yes. Uh, the, the church at Sardis. One of the things. Let's just look at, at Sardis. Sardis was a very, very important city. I mean, it's one of it was a, the, the area that we're looking at where the seven churches are was the province, the state, the country, the empire at one time of Lydia, mm -hmm. and Sardis was the capital of that. Mm -hmm. And Sardis was one of the most famous of the ancient cities, um, going back to Cyrus and Cyrus the Great. Mm -hmm. It had been part of the uh, Babylonian Empire had been part of uh, the Persian Empire, been part of the Greek Empire, been part of the, the Roman Empire. So at the time we're looking at it here, when John is on the Isle of Patmos and getting this message from the Lord to pass on to the churches, this is a part of the Roman Empire. And in 17 AD, not, not very long uh, in historical terms before this letter is written, there was a massive earthquake there in that western part of Turkey that destroyed a dozen of the most important cities, and, and Sardis was one, it was literally destroyed. Right. But Tiberius was the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. no, he was, emperor. Emperor. He was emperor. not an empire. He was an emperor. He was an emperor. Yeah. So Tiberius uh, sponsored rebuilding the city. And because of that, Sardis was one of the first cities in Asia Minor there to become involved in Caesar worship ah. because of that. And, of course, they had the regular pantheon of gods, their own form of Artemis, uh, which was Diana back in Ephesus, and lots and lots of pagan gods. And there had been a lot, a lot of Jewish people, historically, um, had been there at the time of this writing for, gosh, I guess, hundreds of years from the time of the Babylonian captivity. So it has a rich, rich history. It was a very important city politically, and it was also very important economically. And interestingly, Sardis was the city where currency was invented, oh. where they actually minted for the first time silver and gold coins. Oh. So it, it has that. It was a wealthy, wealthy city. Now, the other city in the seven churches that was very wealthy was Laodicea. Okay. So there's something in common between the church in Laodicea and the church at Sardis. God has nothing good to say to them. To Sardis. No. Well, there's or nothing to good to say to the Laodicea. That's what I'm saying. I think there's a little bit good in Sardis. Actually, no. Well, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right? We're talking about to the church. Right. God doesn't say anything good to, to the, church, the church, as we will see. He has something good to say about the remnant that is left in, in the church. Right. At least is Sardis has a they remnant. Did, did Laodicea have a remnant? Well, we, we don't, let's not don't get too far. Let's not get weeks ahead of ourselves here. Yeah. But, but the point is that in this letter, this is the first letter that we encounter, where literally the Lord has nothing to commend, to approve of in this church, right? In the, as the church as a whole, as a body. Right. Okay? Uh, we're doing this study. One of the reasons we started the study was to find the things that are pleasing God and the things that are displeasing God. So what we're going to find here is something that's very, very displeasing to God. 
All right, let's start by let's start by reading the letter and then come back and we'll go through it a bit at a time. <laughs> to the angel of the church in Sardis, write. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So you're saying that Sardis is the only one that he speaks to the a remnant? Oh no, he's no. always speaking to, to, a, remnant. to a remnant. Oh, okay. The book of Revelation is written to the bond servants of right. Jesus Which Christ. Is and that probably is the remnant, all right? Right, right, right? But specifically to these to these churches. But let me let me you're just getting a little bit ahead of you. Let this talk I mean, because I want to take this in order. Okay. And the letter, remember I talked about how Jesus addresses himself to these churches and there's revelation in what he has to say. Okay, so he, he says it. He has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Mm -hmm. The seven spirits of God. I, I want to tell you, and, and last week we talked about, we spoke about conjecture, about speculation. I can't tell you from Scripture exactly what that means. You know, Jesus said in the beginning of this letter that he has the seven stars. And, and it, right. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Seven is, throughout Scripture, a, a number of completion or perfection. Right. All right. So he is bringing that perfection. The seven stars, he said in the beginning of this book of Revelation, represented all of the churches. So he has the churches. They belong to him. Everything belongs to him, right? Yes. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There is nothing that does not belong to God. Uh, not to get distracted, but I want to tell you, nothing belongs to the devil. <clears throat> nothing he, belongs to us. He's a thief. You know, if somebody steals your car and they're driving around in your car, the fact that they're driving around in it, does not give them ownership of that car. does not mean that it's theirs, exactly. right? The devil may be going to and fro. He may have this present world and its system in, in his power, mm -hmm. but it's not his. Yeah. He owns nothing. God owns everything, right? So, let, let's get in. He says, I know your deeds, that you have a name and that you're alive, but you are dead. It's not about the deeds that they're doing that makes them alive or dead, but it is about the deeds that they do that are the evidence of where they are spiritually. Right. That's right. true in all of our lives, all right? We've talked about this a number of times because this is a, a theme throughout God's message to us. He will look for faith in our lives, mm -hmm. but like James says, you can't see faith. Yeah. You can only see the yeah. fruit of faith which is, James says, our works, our deeds, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So he's looking at what this church is doing, the people in this church, are they're what they're doing, or what they're not doing. And he's, it's based on that, what he sees their action in their lives, that he says that you're, you, you think you're alive, you have a name that you're alive, but you're not, you're dead. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's a pretty horrible statement. It is. Okay, let's let's start talking about what what is what's life and death. What is life and death? What? Yeah, how do you define? He says, you know, you think you're alive. What what's what does it mean to be alive? To be uh, alive yeah. in Christ. Well, because otherwise, it says that there everybody else out there who does not have a right relationship with God through the Father, they are dead and walking in their transgressions. Right, right. In the garden, way back in the garden, let's take it right back to the beginning, God spoke to, to Adam and said, the day that you eat, if you eat of that fruit that I told you not to eat of, you die. Yes, yes. Well, they ate. Adam and Eve ate of that fruit. Did they die? Yes. The answer yes. has to be, the answer has to be yes, or God's word is not trustworthy. That's right. But you see, they're still walking around. Right. God put them out of the garden, and they're still doing things. But 
Death is about not having a relationship with God. Separation. He is life. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without Jesus Christ, you are not alive. Amen. You're a zombie. That's right. It's that, where do you think the idea of zombies, zombies come from? Satan, Satan has no creative power. No. He can only twist the truth, and he's twisted a truth. Mm -hmm. Because all of the people that are out there without that right relationship with God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ, they are dead. Yes. All right? But here he's talking about the church. <clears throat> the church has a name. What's the name of the church? Christ. Yes. The anointed. No. Well... It's not that. It's, it's, it's we are named after him, for we have died, and our life is hidden in him, right? If you're called a Christian, you're, you're proclaiming that you are alive in Christ, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Well, you know, Solomon said 3,000 years ago, there's nothing new under the sun, okay? So I want to read you a verse from, from Paul's letter to the Romans. Okay. okay. I'm going to read... From Romans chapter two, I'm going to read from verse. I'm going to read verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? I'm with you. Okay. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. What Paul is saying. And this is going back, and this goes all the way back, that there are people who are, who are called Jews who are not Jews. That's right. I mean, they are not the people of God. Right, exactly. And so in the same way, you know, that's why I'm saying, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Here we come to a time where these people are called Christians, but they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to be born again. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have life. Right. You're dead. So he's saying about this church, Speaking of the church in general, mm -hmm. you have a name that you're alive. The name is Jesus Christ. But they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, so they are dead. Not all Jews are Jesus. circumcised right. apart. Right. Not all Christians are disciples of Jesus Christ. Right. That make, Is yes. that a simple sure. statement? Mm -hmm. So if they're not, what are they? I, now, let me, you know, yes. uh, I know you're going to give me a little grace. Okay. But I think when we're talking about here, people that call themselves Christians, you could basically break this into three categories. Okay. Ready? Okay. C and E Christians. Okay. Cultural Christians. Yes. What was the first one? C, C and E. C and E. C and E. Yes. Okay. You will explain that. I hope so. Okay. And the remnant. C and E. Mm -hmm. I'm not C of right. E. My English friends, <laughs> C of E is the Church of England. Right. Okay. C and E is Christmas and Easter. There oh, you go. okay. <laughs> how many how many people that call themselves Christians? Do you know that their their only spirituality, if you would call it that, rises up at those two holidays? <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Okay. You know, come Christmas time. They get, let's put Christ back in Christmas. Okay. That's, another, go, so, that's another Bible study. That's another Bible study entirely. But the fact is, they go to church on Christmas. Yes. They go to church on Easter. And that's it. That's not, if, you, if that's your life, if that's, you have no life. You're dead in your transgressions. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And I don't say this for your condemnation. I'm trying to sound the alarm. I'm trying to blow the trumpet in Zion. I'm trying to shout a warning. Yes. You know, it says, Paul says, let a man examine himself. All right? If you're, if you're that person that becomes, quote, unquote, Christian a couple times a year, you're not a Christian at all. Mm -hmm. If we define Christian as a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. Right. Okay? I'm, you've got to get your definitions right. And then cultural Christians. <clears throat> These are... Christianity is about relationship. Not tradition. Okay. Ever so many Christians, quote unquote, they have that title because of their relationship, not with God, but because of their relationship with parents. 
Right. Who had them baptized as babies. Mm -hmm. They didn't make a conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ. Did they? No. So their Christianity is based on their relationship with their parents. But don't you think that somewhere along the line, as they're getting older, everybody, they make a decision? Everybody gets confronted with that decision. Yes. There is no doubt right. about that. All right? So if they everybody continue gets, on, then but, they may just But the fact of the matter is, if that's how you became a Christian, is because your parents had you baptized as a child, right. and you have not made this conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ, to call him Lord, to now surrender all to him, with him. Yeah. and the fact is you're deceiving yourself. You may have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. Does that sound harsh? Well, listen, it's the truth. If the truth sounds harsh, I can't. I, I will take no responsibility for that. I will take... God's word is true. God's word is true. Jesus Christ didn't say, hey, it would be nice if you were born again. He didn't say, you know, you might want to think. He said, you must be born again. You must come into new life, into a relationship with God the Father. Period. And you have to do it. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody can do that for you. You have to, have to make a re your own relationship yes. with God the Father. That's right. Through Jesus Christ. I have a question. Go ahead. And that's and it says, <clears throat> I know your deeds that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. With the name, I'm just thinking about like denominations. That's that's another whole story. So this is part of the problem, though. That's part of cultural Christianity. Yeah. You know, the word of God says, Let there be no division among you. The word of God says that there is only one name given by which men can be saved. The word of God says that we should be known by the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, God, God may have used men powerfully like Calvin or Luther or, I mean, go on and name a whole bunch of them. But I don't want to be a Calvinist. I don't want to be a Luther. I want to be a Christian, a yes. follower, a disciple of yes. Jesus Christ. And that is what the remnant does. That remnant is that faithful. We'll talk about that more because it's in here, all right? Listen, I'm not making this stuff up. Get your, get your Bible out and read what this says. This is really, really important. Are, are you a cultural Christian? I mean, is I think I mentioned last week or the week before or not long ago that one of the one of the reasons that we've stopped here is for me to finish up some books that I've been working on. I mean, as we've been traveling around the world and, and sharing the gospel teaching, uh, I've been writing a number of books and none of them are finished. And I decided, well, sit down and get them done. I didn't decide that. I believe God spoke that to me. And one of the first books that will be finished is called The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. If, if you are saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, if you are saved by the atoning work of Jesus Christ, if you are redeemed, your life should bear evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There should be fruit. You know, B.J. Thomas, I don't remember, remember he, was a, he was a secular singer who got saved, mm -hmm. and years ago he wrote, I think he wrote, and, but he performed a song called, What a Difference You've Made in My Life. Yes. Beautiful song. Yes. What God has done in your life, the difference that he's made in your life, should be a visible difference. Right? Christ should be visible in you. Mm -hmm. One of the ministries that every Christian has, true Christian has, is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place that you go. Mm -hmm. We're to bring the knowledge, the presence of Christ Jesus. Fragrant Je aroma. Jesus said you know, that we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Our, our relationship with God has to be visible. We're not supposed to be hidden Christians, okay? So, that, by the way, if you want to know something, if you want to find out what real Christianity is, don't, don't go get a catechism from your denomination. Don't go look at the church building. Go read the Sermon on the Mount. Go read from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And there you will see what Christianity is supposed to look like. Normal this, Christianity. Normal Christianity. This is the definitive teaching of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. on what the way a Christian, all Christians, should live. That's right. Okay? And, and I want to tell you something. I've done a lot of teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. As we have traveled, that's been one of the passions of my life, is to say, you know, there's so much common in Christianity today that doesn't look like normal Christianity. If you define normal Christianity 
as the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Praying for your enemies. What? Forgiving those who have, have hurt you. That's right. this is, that's, that is what it is. Understanding that blessed are the poor. It's not about God wants you rich. God will give you more than you can think or ask. But he has to start with that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm not going to do the whole Sermon on the Mount here. But go read the Sermon on the Mount and see what your life is supposed to look like. And if your life does not look like the Sermon on the Mount, you had better get someplace, have a conversation with God, and find out if you are alive in Christ or you just have a name about Christ. Mm. This is serious stuff. This is life and death. And by the way, time... I don't, know, I don't know how long it will be before Jesus comes back. I happen to believe way we, we're rushing towards that, that glorious yes. end, and it, a glorious end. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not saved, if you're one of those cultural Christians or one of those C and E Christians, it will not be a mm -hmm. glorious mm -hmm. end. And you will not want to be there when it happens. Mm -hmm. But if you are that faithful remnant, then we will be rejoicing mm -hmm. at the end. And that end is coming. We are closer to it today than we were yesterday. Yes. And we will be closer yet tomorrow. Amen. This is life and death issues. That's why, that's what it says. It's about life and, and it's about death. Right. Okay. Now the interesting thing is, if you, if you look at this, these people are dead and yet the Lord is still calling out to them. Mm -hmm. There is still time. There's still an opportunity. But it says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as your fathers did in America. It's like the church of, this, this has so many parallels to the church of Laodicea. Of course, the church of Laodicea is worse yet. Yes. But when this verse is used so much in evangelism, behold, I stand at the door and knock. God wasn't saying that to the unsaved. He was saying that to the church. That's right. That is a message to that church at Laodicea. So there is yet time. Use it, and use it wisely. Use it well. What is death? What's a cultural Christian? You know, there, there are cultural Christians. There are cultural Muslims. There are cultural Hindus. I mean, lots of people are just born into a family, and they just are because their parents are. They just, they, they are. It's not because of this relationship. That's true of so many Jews. All right, now the, the Jewish people were God's chosen, and he, his gifts and his calling are irrevocable. There's, there is coming a time, that time has not started, where God will lift that veil, mm -hmm. and the Jewish people will see that Christ is not against the Jews, but he died for the Jews first, to the Jew first. The message goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. All right? Mm -hmm. Listen, and if you hear his call, if you hear his voice, Today is the day to repent. What does that mean to repent? Just to say, yes, Lord. Change I'm sorry. Mind. I'm sorry for what I've been, what I've done. Give me that new life, that new, that fresh start. Because he wants you to a fresh start. So here he's calling to a church. That is, you know, how can it be a church if they're dead? Because God sees beyond. beyond. He's, yeah. he's already so he's saying choice. to them in verse 2, wake up. Wake up. Now, just, just interesting, so many times through Scripture, the parallel between being dead and being asleep. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. I was it's, just trying to think, I think it was in one of the Psalms where it begins, Awake, awake, O Israel. Awake, awake, O Israel, yes. Yeah. The, the, the point is, and the fact, if you're not, if you're a Christian, yes, I'm doing the quotes, mm -hmm. if you're a Christian, and don't have that right relationship with God, if you're not living that life that the Scripture calls you to, then you're dead or you're asleep. Either way, if you're asleep, what you're, what you're doing is a dream. And I will tell you, and I'm sure you'll find out probably the hard way, it's a nightmare. It is, it's a nightmare. Yeah. You live in a world where everything, is, wrong, everything is going wrong. It's been going wrong for a long, long time. The world is not, the world, there's a lot wrong in it, right? And every day it becomes more evident. Yes. Every day it becomes more evident. 
I hope it becomes evident to you because there's a way to escape that. There is a way to peace in the midst of all this chaos. Mm. You know, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world does, because the world doesn't have real peace to give. All you have to do is reach out and accept that. But you've got to understand that being a Christian is not about, I belong to this denomination, or I belong to that denomination, or I go to church twice a year. Being a Christian is about being a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Having received the power to do that, because on your own, you don't even have the ability to do it. But you have the power if you have His Holy Spirit within you. To live that life that gives evidence of what God has done in your life. And bear witness, bring testimony of Jesus Christ into the world. So wake up. Strengthen the things that remain. Somewhere in this church, there's something that remains. Because even if you're a cultural Christian, you have probably heard the good news. Even if you've only been in church on Christmas and Easter, odds are good that you have heard of the work of Jesus Christ. God's word, Isaiah 55 says, God's word does not go forth and return to him void without accomplishing what he had purposed it for. All right? Somebody was talking to me the other day, and they were talking about, I, I, I honestly don't remember what the context of this was or who I was even having a conversation. They said there was some place, and they saw like a billboard that had Christ outstretched with his nail-scarred hands. And the billboard said, did he do this for nothing? Did he do this for nothing? Do you understand what Jesus Christ went through to get you your salvation? It wasn't just a matter of filling out a going in and having coffee and donuts in a church foyer and filling out a card. That's not what it's about. But if you have heard the word, okay, you have received something from God. That's what it said. Verse 3, so remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. So when someone hears the word, it goes in. It is a seed. It is a seed. It goes in. And if it's not nourished and and fed, it'll die. And that's what he's saying, that they had it, and and it's about to die. It's, it's about the sower and the seed. That's I was just going to say an yes, example. Exactly. That, that's exactly the right example that Mark just brought up. Yeah. The parable of the sower and the seed. Because Jesus tells this parable, and he says, if you don't understand this parable, you'll not understand any of the parables. And what it's about is it talks about the seed, which is the Word of God, and how it's sown on, on bad soil, on rocky soil, on thorny soil, on good soil. And, you know, it, out of all of that, it's like, the, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the fear of persecution, all these things can choke the Word of God. That doesn't mean you didn't receive it. That's right. And you are responsible for it then. Amen. Amen. You know, we talk about that great judgment day when, when mankind will stand before the judgment throne of God. The fact of the matter is, I've been judged. Yes. I was found guilty. Ah, how'd that work out? Worked out quite well because by the grace of God, even though I was found guilty, and the wages of sin is death, any sin, Jesus Christ stepped up and said, I'll take his place, and went and took the consequence, paid the price for my sin, just like he did for yours. That's what I heard. That's the word. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Right? If you've heard the word, you've had a seed planted inside of you. You are responsible for what happens to that seed. Is it going to bring bear fruit? Is it going to come? What fruit? Well, the fruit is a relationship with God the Father. I mean, ultimately, that's what it's about. Ultimately, it's about your relationship with God the Father that made possible by your relationship with Jesus Christ. Ah, he says, "You are which were about to die. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God." I, I don't want to. I, I was going to say I don't want to sound judgmental. I changed my mind. I don't want to sound judgmental, but I want to sound prophetic. If you're spending more time watching football games than you are spending time conversing with God, you're in trouble. Yes. If your whole life and and if your celebration of the birth of Christ, which by the way is not nowhere mm-hmm. in Scripture, right. but if it's all about Santa Claus and gifts and and toys and and Christmas cheer and parties and you know, have a little tipsy drink, you're in trouble. Yes. You're in deep trouble. 
We just had Thanksgiving Day. Alice and I got back to the United States just less than a, a month ago, just in time for Thanksgiving Day, where where this quote unquote Christian nation, which it is not, mm -hmm. celebrates and gives thanks to God. Mm -hmm. The fact is, the people of God are supposed to be a people of Thanksgiving. Every day. Give thanks to the Lord every day, That's right. every single day, every single day, and that again is supposed to be visible in our lives. We're not supposed to be ashamed. You know, the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be proclaiming his name. Because he's the answer to absolutely everyone's Everything. problem. He, everyone. He, the thing is, he's the only answer. That's right. He's the only answer. Every, every other answer you will find is false. It may be a temporary. It's like, you know, you get shot That's in the heart true. and somebody puts a Band-Aid on you. Mm. That may stop the blood coming out for a minute, but you're dead. Right. He said, I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. What, de what deeds are supposed to be completed? What, what deeds are you supposed to be doing? What's the work that we're supposed to be doing? Oh, gosh. Wait a minute. That's exactly what the apostles came and asked Jesus Christ. Believe. Tell us what, what the works, what works should we be doing? And Jesus said, believe on him who the Father. Believe on Jesus said, believe on me. That's the work. That's right. That's the work. And that will bear fruit in your life. It will change you. It will change you into somebody who becomes a walking blessing. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're giving out little trinkets and toys. It is every place that you go, you are bringing that word of life. There is nothing more important than God's word. You know, people left Jesus Christ. This is, this is Like I said, there's nothing new under the sun, is what Solomon said. In John chapter 6, it talks about people that were following Jesus Christ, and they chose to walk away from him, consciously walk away from Jesus, because his word was too hard, was too hard for them, mm -hmm. too difficult. So Jesus didn't go running after him and chase him. You know what he did? He turned to his apostles. He turned to his disciples. So what about you? You're going to leave too? You're going to go too? Where else? And Peter go? said, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, those words of eternal life, if you are a Christian, those, that seed has been planted in you, but it's been written on the tablets of your heart. Yes. You are to bring and speak that word of eternal life. Every place you go, you bring words of life, the words of Jesus Christ, if you're truly a Christian. Yes. If, you're, if you call yourself a Christian, let me ask you a question. When was the last time, out, I'm not talking about in a church building, when was the last time, when you went to a grocery store, when you went to a gas station, when, when at work, when was the last time you shared the Word of God with somebody? Because that's the word of encouragement. That's the word of life. That brings life into people's life. Like I said, I'm not saying this for condemnation, but I pray to God that it would poke you and make you give thought to what the Word of God says. Not to what I say, but to what the Word of God says. This is the Bible study poke. Well, I pray that it is, right? Because he said, if you don't do that, if you don't, and you don't repent, he said, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come to you. I'm going to tell you something. Before I was saved, and I was I was raised very, you know, I was raised in a religious family. I wasn't a very religious guy, but I was one of those. I was basically one of those C and E Christians, right? There was no doubt about it in my own life. Did you read that? So remember what you received? Did you read that? What have you received? The Word. No, it says, so remember what you oh. received and heard, and keep it and repent. Did I not say everything? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I was, must have been thinking of something if, if you missed it, maybe you missed it. Yes. Okay, so let me just say this. Repent! Okay. <laughs> it's change your ways. Okay. Change your yes, direction. Yes, I, I was a man with a plan before I got saved. I knew that the life that I was that I was living was not pleasing to God. Like I said, I was a cultural Christian. I knew enough. I had heard enough. I had received enough to know that my life didn't line up with what I knew would be pleasing to God. So I was a man with a plan. I figured, well, I'm going to wait, and just before I die, if I do I'm going to I'm going to be good. I'll run off to the confession, I'll, and and everything will be all right. 
God's going to come like a thief, like a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. You know, not when you're prepared, because if you if you're not haven't repented, you don't have that right relationship. Let me tell you something: you are not prepared for what is coming. Mm -hmm. You're not. Mm -hmm. You're not. Today, as we're filming this, today is December twelfth, two thousand and fourteen. Friday, right? We're filming it on Friday. This is, if you could, if you could live another hundred years, you will still never have another Friday, November twelfth, December, December twelfth, two thousand fourteen. Thank God for a suitable help. Me, you only get one. That's why the Word of God says, "Redeem the time," especially in these evil last days. Okay. So, remember what you've received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Nobody knows at what hour he's coming. However, we as Christians are supposed to be able to see the signs. And when we see the signs, we should be looking up and rejoicing, for we know that our salvation draweth nigh, near. He who overcomes, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry. It says in verse 4, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's our remnant. Now, during the course of this study, we've, we've had opportunity to talk about the remnant a number of times. Yes. That's that few that remain. Yes. Remember, Jesus said, Many are going the wrong way, few are going the right way. That's right. But it's by His grace that there will be a remnant, a few that are left. All right? So there's not a, there's a, at the beginning, Mark said, Well, that's, this is like what God says is good, right? But he's not saying it to the church. He's saying this is this is there's a few people in Sardis. Again, Sardis was a, a very comfortable town, and I think I think that the riches and comfort of Sardis and Laodicea were the biggest dangers. I'm going to say this, and this ought to get me in trouble. I think I said it to you the other day, Mark. We were having a conversation, and I said I, I honestly think for the typical Christian. It is more dangerous to live in America than it is to live in Syria. Because we don't have to pick up a cross here. Well, it's not, that's not what it is. I think we're in more danger. Because the simple fact of the matter is, in, in lands like that are under true persecution. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. And those people are only killing the body. Whereas here, our culture, our terrible, ungodly culture in this country is killing the spirit for all eternity. This is more dangerous. It's more dangerous to live in that kind of comfort that draws you away from the Lord than it is to live under persecution. Jesus never said to fear of persecution. He said, listen, you get persecuted, pray for those people. They're the ones who are in danger. Not, not, but here in the West, we're being killed by the culture that makes us comfortable and at ease. Okay. But there will always be that remnant, that few who remain faithful. And, you know, Jesus knows who they are. And he said when he comes back, will he find faith? It's going to be in the, in the remnant. They haven't soiled their garments. How do you soil your garment? And what does it mean? And, and then he immediately says, they'll walk with me in white. They're worthy. The greatest example of white garments, what would you say? In heaven. Garments of praise. How about the Mount of Transfiguration? Oh, yeah. huh? Transfiguration. Okay. Right? Jesus and a couple of the apostles go up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and there is uh, Moses and Elijah and Jesus Christ. And it says that Jesus, his raiment, his clothing, was whiter than any fuller's soap could, could make them. Right? That's, that's the white, and that's the white that we're going to have. And, and I've done a lot of teaching on this because it's interesting. They used to, they called them the fullers, were the people that cleaned clothes, right? When you clean clothes, you take a white garment that needs to be cleaned. They're not adding anything to that. They're taking the stuff out. They're taking the dirt out, all right? It's about getting the dirt out. It's not about putting white in, all right? And it could be considered not dirt, but the world, the earth. Sin. Well, so, soil their garments. So if you take the earth 
or the world out of us, we become whiter. Well, it's all about the pollution. That's right. It's all about the pollution that dirties the garments, right? Mm -hmm. It's the sin. Because in, in Isaiah, God said, and this is 750 years before the birth of Christ, it says the whole earth is polluted by the transgressions of men. That's the pollution. That's the dirt. That's the filth. The garbage that you let in from the world, and there is an assault on you. Well, every time you listen to the radio, watch the television, see a billboard, read a newspaper, it is filled with filth. Yes. That will add dirt if you allow it. Unless, and here's the key, it says we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Yes. If indeed you are yes. sealed by that Holy Spirit, so the dirt can't get in. But yes. get on the outside, who cares about the outside? The outside's perishing anyhow. That's right. Dying as we sit here. That's all right. Look at me, I'm, I'm rotting away. Even as we sit here, I'm rotting away. But that's not me. That's only the thing that I'm wearing. The me that is alive and will live forever is the Spirit within me. And that's sealed by the Holy Spirit. But be careful. You don't open the door. Don't give the devil an opportunity. God will, God will clean you here. He overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. Whoa, now wait a minute. Whoa. I didn't realize you could have your book name erased. Well, you most assuredly can. Ooh. Now, a lot of, this is one of the great debates I've heard in a lot of churches, okay? Once can you, can you lose your salvation? I want to say that. You, you can't lose your salvation. Or you can give it back. You can give it up. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But a minute ago, I mentioned John chapter 6, where people walked away from him. Right. They left him. So you erase their name? You know, I know, I know a lot of people are looking for a great revival. I like revival. I want to see people come to life. That's, that's, what, that's what this letter is about to them. But the fact of the matter, Jesus and Paul both talk about the fact that in the last days, there will be a great apostasy. And apostasy is a falling away. It is about leaving a relationship. You can't fall away from where you're not at. Could there be a false revival? Because it got the church of Laodicea, which we'll be discussing later, but that's a false revival. <clears throat> Absolutely. Because it's not really a revival, it's just, well, we'll talk about that in Laodicea. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see that in that light. Yes. Well, but the fact of the matter is, he's talking about people whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, and he's saying, well, he'll erase it. Take a name out. Now, it's, it says when we're, when we're faithless, he's still faithful. You have to consciously choose not to, to, to live this life in order to have that happen. But people do it. Like I said, and I find it interesting and not coincidental that in the book of Revelation here later on, that the name, the name of that evil one is revealed. The number of his name is 666. And interestingly, if you look at the Gospel of John, and obviously the numbering system of the Bible didn't come for hundreds of hundreds of years after he wrote. But you know, he wrote in the Gospel of John, in John 6, 6, 6, is about where people walk chose to walk away from Jesus Christ because his word was too difficult. That would be the falling away. That's walking away. I mean it is falling away. Mm -hmm. Because because they, he says it his disciples. They it. it says many of his disciples, therefore, weren't following him anymore. They chose to walk away because it got too difficult. Now, you know what? If it's getting difficult, you're doing it wrong. It's going to be difficult to your flesh. But it shouldn't be difficult to your spirit. Jesus came that you might have joy. Jesus came that you might have life and have it abundantly. So the fact of the matter is if it's... If, if following Jesus Christ is a burden unto you, you are doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Jesus goes on to say, Then I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who overcomes. We talked about overcomers, and every one, every one of these letters has talked about the overcomers. And he says, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, just as a point of fact, and I, I think this is worthy of note. He says, if you overcome, 
And talking about to the, to the ones here in Sardis who are repentant and come into a right relationship. He says, I'll, I'll confess them to the Father. I want to read you Matthew, Matthew 11, uh, Matthew 10 rather, verse 32. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him mm. before my Father who is in heaven. That's right. Yeah. He, he, he made a promise. His word can't be broken and he can't lie. He said, everybody who confesses him before men, he'll confess before the Father. Now he's talking to a church and he's saying, if you overcome, I will confess. You know what that means? It means that if you're not overcoming, you're not confessing his name before men. you got to right. go to verse thir to thir go ahead, 33 read. is the opposite. But, oh, I know, yeah. Right. But whomever yeah. shall deny, deny me, before men, I will out. also deny him before my Father, who is in heaven. So that's taken him out. Well, so what you have, what, what I'm trying to get to is, it's obvious from this from this statement here that the church in in Sardis, these people are not confessing John, Jesus that's Christ. Right, that's right. They're not confessing Jesus Christ. They're not making Christ evident in their lives. They're not bringing the knowledge of His presence into every place. Because had they been doing that. He would be, he would never say, then I'll, then I'll confess you before my father. Because he already made that promise. That's right. Yes, so, did. so I, I, you know, I, are you a secret Christian? Mm, closet Christian? A closet Christian, a cultural Christian, a C and E Christian. Yeah. Are you one of those Christians that nobody really knows you're a Christian? And I'm not talking about putting a bumper sticker on your car. I am talking about you being an ambassador of Jesus Christ. An ambassador brings the message for the kingdom he represents. Are you bringing that message into your family? Are you bringing that message into your workplace? Are you bringing that message into the marketplace? Are you a witness of Jesus Christ? If you are not, he will not be a witness of you before the Father. And you're in big trouble. You have to make up your mind what you are. You have to make up your mind. It's your choice. Whosoever will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But you have to choose to receive that. It's always about choice. He, God said all the way back in the wilderness, he said to the people of God, he said, I have set before you life and death. Choose life. It's your choice. But you can't play the game. You can't say, well, you know, I'm a member of that church and that's all there is to it. It's not about that. It is about living that life of Jesus Christ. It is about dying to yourself and allowing Jesus to live through you. Yes, yes. That's what it's about. And there's no doubt about that. Amen. Well, I want to move right along because I, I actually do want to get to the next two churches, which we will do at our next session here. Okay? So, let me read the final verse in that letter. Chapter 3, verse 6, God says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is exactly the same as in every chapter every, every letter. 2, every letter. Every verse letter. 29. That's every letter. Exactly every, letter. Same. every letter ends and the same way. If you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Are you hearing what the Spirit of God is saying? Yeah. Are you hearing what the... Pray, mm -hmm. God, dig out my ears so I can hear your voice. Open the eyes of my heart that I might see wonderful things in your word. Because if we're not hearing, then we're not obeying, then we're in big trouble. You know, the Pharisees were very religious. They were more religious than you. Yeah. But Jesus said they have eyes and they cannot see. They're blind guides leading the blind. They have ears, but they, don't, they can't hear. Can you hear what the Spirit of God is saying? This is a time of decision. It is a time of decision. For you to, to examine yourself, like the Word of God says to do, and, and say to yourself, honestly, go in just between you and you and God, nobody else. Are you living a life that is pleasing to God? Are you living that life that bears evidence, bears witness of the love of God in you, the power of God in you? Are you? And make it an honest, honest assessment. Because the simple answer is, if you're not, repent. God will give you the power. 
He will forgive you for all of the mistakes that you've made. That's, that's the joy. If we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. He gives us a way. Always he's not trying. He's not a God who desires punishment. He is a God of life. He is a God, Peter said, who desires that none should perish. And yet here, people are perishing left and right. Out there in the world that you live in, people are perishing left and right. Have a little talk with Jesus. Have a little talk. And be honest with him. Because he has no other thing to be to you but honest. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And he may be the life that you're missing if you don't have that right relationship. So, Father, we just thank you for your amazing gift of your son, Christ Jesus who did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And we thank you that, that when he left this planet, Lord, and ascended into me in heaven to be with you, he sent the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. And your word is truth. Give us understanding of these words, Lord God. Give us a burning desire, a passionate desire, to be what you desire that we are. To be faithful to you, you who are faithful. Lord, let us be alive in you, dead to ourselves and alive to you. Let us have a heart that cries out like John the Baptist did, that you must increase, but we must decrease. Let us be hidden in you, so that you might be evident to all we meet. I just praise you and thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So finished our whole church. Yes. And now it's going to get really interesting because we're going to, the next two churches kind of are really what the, the decision is about. The church at Philadelphia and the church at Laodicea. Very, very much opposites. Mm -hmm. The church at Philadelphia, God has nothing bad to say about. The church at Laodicea, God has nothing good to say about. So be back with us next time for our next Bible study here at Bible Talk. Until then, I know, and Alice wants to tell you, Jesus loves you a lot. God bless you and goodbye until next time. Be used by Him for the glory of His name. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.